Hello. Thank you for joining me. My name is Albjorn, and today I will be talking about my photo editing workflow. A little bit about me. I've been photographing for probably around 35 years at this point. Uh, I've always had an interest in it since childhood, and I had taken that interest and was doing a lot of cosplay photography uh, before I got back into the furry fandom. Uh, around 97. And so uh, I thought I would I would show uh, I mean some of the cosplay photography that I was doing, um, some of the fursuit photography uh, that I had done. And uh, I'd been branching out into um, using external lights to uh, accentuate the characters that I was I was photographing. Uh, I make use of existing light. Uh, such as this one of Rio, and a lot of photography is about finding the right uh, position and angle to uh, really portray the story that you want to accomplish. But today's talk is going to be about... Um, I also do other types of photography, especially cons. Um, but today what I'm going to be talking about is the workflow and the process that I do when taking thousands of photos at a convention and uh, working through those photos in a timely fashion. So we're going to take the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes and go over what my process and workflow is. So. I'll wrap up with that one. So. I figured I would take photos from uh, Anthro Northwest. And so, as you can see, I'm using a Photoshop Lightroom, which is a tool that I'm familiar with, but many of these features are available for all software packages. And uh, you'll see on the left here that I, I took around a bit over 2,000 photos. And I've selected a subset of 277. I just went through and grabbed a few different sections of photos to show kind of what it is that it looks like. Um, and you'll see that like when I'm first starting out at a con and, and remembering how to do uh, the different setups, what the lighting is like at the convention center, I shoot in full manual. And so a lot of times the first few photos don't actually turn out that well. <laughs> um, one of the big things with photography is, is taking a number of them and learning from the mistakes that happen and being able to quickly assess it on the fly. So in this case this photo is, is pretty blurry because it was taken at 1 25th of a second. Uh, I'm letting in as much light as I pretty much can at f 1.8. That's a pretty fast lens. Uh, it's fixed length at 50 millimeter and uh, I'm using a crop sensor and I'm also pushing the noise levels of my camera. It's a pretty old camera. And so 1250 uh, definitely is going to show a lot of grain uh, if the YouTube or whatever broadcasting codec doesn't make that uh, apparent. So I'll blow it up really big, but even at one-to-one -one, you can make it out if you were looking at this uh, closely. So anyways, I like having the overview up here and so that I can zoom in on a section and see where I am. And what I'll do is I'll just scroll through the photos. So in this case, there was a character that I wanted to capture and I took uh, 13 photos of them. And so I was trying to capture, if I recall, the movement, right? So the, the arm here has a bit of blur, uh, but the thing that I've noticed that's the most important for capturing fursuits, uh, or anyone for that matter, is the focus of the eye. If the eye isn't in focus, that's something that is uh, very quickly picked up on by the viewer and detracts from the overall image. So my number one priority is checking the focus of the eye as I go through. Uh, and here we go. You notice that I I've been, I dialed it up to 150th of a second, 
And then I finally snapped it up to 1 60th of a second, which, because less light is coming in, if we go all the way back to the beginning, you'll notice that these blacks, like the eye itself, is somewhat of a gray because I'm letting more light in. I'm keeping the camera open for longer. And so if we go over here to the 1 60th of a second, I'm letting in uh, less than half the light without changing anything else. And so these eyes are becoming quite dark. And Lightroom has a nice little feature over here with a histogram in which you can see where the light value ranges land. And uh, the way you read a histogram is it's basically a set of buckets of light. And so you can see that if you were to count up all of these dots over here that were super, super bright, that would be this section of the histogram. And if you were to count up all the pixels and dots that were very, very dark, that would be this end of the histogram. So glancing at this uh, and checking to see how much of it is squished over there on the left side can tell you how much of it you can't get back. Because if it's black, 0% lightness, you, you can't really multiply and get you know 10% or 50% back out of that blackness range. Uh, you're pretty much stuck with it just being stuck at black. Same with the whiteness. If we were to... Uh, you notice here that we didn't actually clamp our pixels on the right. So this big long line, there's not a line that at, that's at the very, very end. So if we were to lower this exposure for some reason, uh, we would actually get some detail, that, like the stairs here, would show up. And you'd see that that big spike got shoved downwards because those bright pixels got brought down to be kind of more of a gray. Whoops, not that one. So everything shoved back up and I'm going to take the ones at the dark side and shift them along. And so now this has gotten very, very bright, but now we can see more of what's in the shirt. So th that's a little bit of a diversion of something that's that's important. We'll get to that more as we move along. But you'll notice that this particular photo um, is pretty crisp. If we look in, we can actually make out the mesh of the eyes, and uh, there's enough information here. So what I tend to do as I'm zipping through this is I'll keep one hand on the number keys and one hand on the arrow keys, and I'll just go along, moving back and forth, and I'll say, oh, well, Lightroom has this ability here at the bottom to do stars zero, or one through five, and so I'll rate things that I'm interested in keeping as a three, and then if it's, if it's a really good one for now, I would move it up to a four. And my general rating is two stars for name badges, which we'll get to, and then three stars for ones that are strong candidates for editing. These are ones that I would send to the fursuiter, even if they didn't make my cut for sending to Flickr, or whatever the image hosting is. Four stars for sending to Flickr, or whatever the image hosting is. And five stars are the ones that I would tweet out um, in, in the, the somewhat regular tweets that I do when, when I've got the bandwidth. So this one I'm rating a three, and uh, I'm comparing between these two. I kind of like the motion that's going on here, so I would, I would probably rate that a four out of this set. This one dropped down to 120. Uh, 25th of a second. So if we zoom in on that mesh, we can see that actually stayed pretty much in focus. So um, things brightened up everywhere. We've got some motion going on. So this one would probably become my new four. And I'd pop back and drop that last one down. That one's way too blurry. 
as they start moving. This one's got a trash can in the background. It's always important to pay attention to the background. And that's it for that character. And I suspect I may have gotten their badge earlier. So we'll keep going. This character, the flash, came out way too bright. And it was still too bright, and I'm like, what the heck is going on? Dial back the flash a bit. That time, the batteries were giving up, so it didn't actually fire. <laughs> but if we go back to this one, we can see over here that while it looks really bright, the uh, we don't have a huge spike over here. So that means that the, the information that's on this nose and everything, there's still a lot of texture that we can work with. Everything's really nice and sharp. If I bring down the exposure, you'll be able to see just all that, how much texture is actually there. So this is a really strong candidate. And you'll also see on the right that I have a flash behind them that's adding a bit of rim light, which separates them from the background, and that's a nice technique that I employ. So that one's a four, and gosh. Uh, this one's tempting. I would have to do a bit of work by lightening up the face on the right, but that rim lighting came out really, really good. Um, but then we've got this one, where I've adjusted the lighting on the left. We've still got the good rim lighting going along. They have a cute expression. Uh, this one's definitely a four, probably a five, once I'm done editing. Uh, I move things up to a five at the very end, because I find that... Uh, I get a little optimistic and end up setting too many things a five, and then I have to to shift things back out. So if I do the migration to fives, unless it's very, very clear that this is going to be an amazing shot, if I do that migration towards the end, I have a better sense of how good that entire convention has been and how many kind of keeper shots there are. Um, quite honestly, I'm just going to make that one a five, just because the pose is perfect and the lighting well, I'll have to bring the brightness up here a little bit to get some texture. There's not a lot of work that I would have to do. And here's what I was talking about with the badges. I always try to get a photo of the badges so I can figure out who it was that I was photographing. And I'll set these to a two, which they won't make it online, but it allows me to kind of, once I filter the photos to show me only those things that I'm interested in editing, I can control click them all and then add a tag to indicate that uh, this is their name so I can find them later as I, I go through processing. And we're, we're still at the same photo shoot. Our lighting is kind of dialed in. We're trying out some different poses. So this one's definitely a strong contender. If we bump up the exposure a stop, we can see that we've got lots of information in here. I'm not going to bump up the entire photo, though, because I want the background to be dark. I just want them to be bright. And we'll see how we edit that in just a bit. So we go along. And that's a cute pose. And that one's quite adorable. And then a quick talk about um, forced perspective. This one has a very big belly, and so I was taking a wide-angle lens. You'll see over here, it's no longer 50 millimeter. Now we're using an 11 millimeter, quite wide-angle lens. And we're getting very, very up close, and a wide-angle lens accentuates the things that are nearby and diminishes the things that are farther away. And so you can use this forced perspective to make them look larger than they are. I think I think this one's probably a strong contender out of those ones. And that one's pretty good as a portrait. I really like how the lighting worked out on this. We've got rim lighting over here, and then we've got kind of an overexposure going on that helps disambiguate their head. So that one is actually more like a f getting close to a five. 
And we've got their badges. And this one I wouldn't necessarily keep because uh, this area right here isn't, uh, it creates too much variation. And so it's not nearly as smooth as, say, this one here, which still has the effect, but we've got the strong rim lining on the right. So that's a fairly static pose. And then we try out different poses when we're photographing for suitors to uh, see if we can kind of evoke more of an, a, you know, a, a more active moment that's being captured. And there's their badges. And then I see this, this individual relaxing, and I'm like, well, hey, now that they're on their, they're sitting down, a lot of the air is pushed forward. So now we've got much more of an accentuation that's possible. So we'll go ahead and add that back in. And here you can see the uh, the fill flash that's off to the right didn't fire, but this kind of uh, strong key lighting can actually it's pretty aggressive, and and so that we could make that work quite well. And we'll we'll save the badge off. Okay, so, um, but. I thought it would be nice to show that uh, not all of the photos <laughs> end up coming out perfectly. They, um, you can see over here on the right, this one's really overexposed. So if we drop that exposure down, you can actually recover a fair amount of texture. Uh, but there's going to be areas that uh, are just flat out gray that we can't recover information from. Uh, and, and so you lose that texture that's in there. So this one is, is slightly less exposed. So if we, we moved it up a tiny bit, we can compare. Oops, we went with the wrong direction. But we can kind of see what we're talking about, where like you can see more of the texture in there. So as we move on, I also wanted to uh, mention <laughs> dance competitions are extremely hard because you're wanting to capture the movement. Like that one's a that one's kind of neat as far as movement's concerned, but you also really want to be able to capture the the face in a static position. Um, I mean, it, it's it's an aesthetic, but now, now we've got a much sharper eye. There's still a bit of blur going on. In this particular case, everything is, is static. Oh, but heck, now they're up in the air, right? Which is a pretty pretty compelling shot. And we've got a bit of blur going on with their ear. So here their, their head is moving, there's too much blur, so I'm not interested in that. But you'll get these micro moments where other things are moving, like the tail, but the head is static. And so I, I tend to do a burst mode when shooting dance competitions. So that I can try to capture those brief moments where they're looking right at the camera. Things are mostly sharp. We've got some nice lighting going on here. I also try to time the shots so I get these, these action moments where their, their feet are off the ground. And this one isn't as compelling because they're kind of just standing and there's, with the depth of field, it's hard to see. But here, it's much more dynamic. Um, and the lighting is lighting up the foot, which accentuates the fact that the shadow is disconnected. So, yeah. So I'll zip through these kinds of things. 
and then I just wanted to show the um, parade lighting setup that I had where the flash is back behind them again so we have the fill lighting and we have a nice strong umbrella light that's filling nice smooth lighting. You can see their shadow here so it's filling them up from this side and uh, yeah it creates a nice separation of effect. So as long as you can time it right. <laughs> and then I also wanted to, to zip through and talk about some of the, the photos within VR chat and some of the processes I might go through. Um, people definitely do like to, to do their party photos. <laughs> And uh, you'll notice that, again, I'm taking a series of shots because, like, the, the difference in... Let me brighten this up a bit. So the difference... Oh, let me do that for all of them. Okay, so you'll see that the difference in expression here just totally makes for a different uh, activity that's going on. <laughs> and so here, I feel like I'm looking a bit concerned, but uh, now I'm looking a bit happier. Uh, everyone else is looking a bit happier. So this particular one, um, is is another one that I would I would pick out of the series. So you know, don't be afraid to take a number of photos because you'll find that uh, there's there's differences, subtle differences that make a big if impact. And then I was gonna talk a bit about something like this where we've got a lot of really dark creatures. And if you look over here, we've got some very strong brights and some very strong darks. So if we were to go in and edit this, uh, keep in mind that you can be editing these photos after you, you take them in VR chat. Now when I do cropping I use a uh, golden spiral because that helps with composition. Uh, and so maybe I want a little bit less of the background so I can focus on these creatures. And these things off to the right adjust your histogram. As I, So I was playing with, with exposure which kind of moves everything up. But like I said, I don't necessarily want these things in the background to be super bright. So I really just want the dark areas to be made a bit brighter so I can see more of the wings going on. So if I drop it down, this is where we were. And if we bring it all the way up, now we can see some of the nebula that's going on. But now I've made it so that uh, the blacks are more of a gray. We can see that because this, this majority section here got shifted to the right. Whereas the parts I was mainly interested in was here in the middle. So we can slide the blacks down just a hair and make it so that that grayish area kind of just falls away back down to black. And other things you can do is you can uh, play around with, say, the clarity, which accentuates changes that occur. It's a very strong tool, so I typically keep it around 10 or so. When working with fursuits, I usually drop this down negative because the 
Um, fur is something that you would like to see as being softer. So, but when we're working with more animated characters, we would like the lines to be sharper. So if we come back over here to this one, well, let's do this one, this one's fun. So if we were to come back here, I popped the exposure up two stops and contrast upping that will shove things to the left and the right. But you know these brights are already awfully bright. So we just wanna take the, the dark colors and shift them down. And you can see there's nothing that's actually full black in this picture because nothing is really down there. So if we just grab that and shift it down, we can see the image getting, having more of a punch contrast here. And Blade here is getting a bit dark. And so if we bring the shadows up, well, that's gonna sh brighten up everything. A lot of this problem here is because of the windshield that's going on. So if we were to increase the, the dehaze amount a touch and brighten those shadows up a bit. Well, it's still not enough. And dehaze also adds a bit of a hue shift, so things are becoming pinker in there. So then, if I was really committed to this picture and I was wanting to spend a lot of time on it, I would potentially work with the adjustment brush. But in the interest of time, a graduated brush can do just about the same effect. Now, obviously, that's way too bright. What I'll do is I'll have it be a nice big transition so you can't necessarily notice what's going on. I lined it up with the car. And then maybe we want to take some of the, the blue out. I'm sorry, some of the pink out, right? Because things are getting a bit pink down there. Make it more of a white. So we're shifting things to the left a bit on the hue. And we're gonna up the clarity just in that car area. Now I'm technically upping the clarity of these tiles. But people aren't gonna notice that so much. And I'm upping the clarity around here, but that aligns quite well with the um, with the background, you can see that it's pretty subtle until I kind of take it away and shift it down. So the background, you don't really see it that much. So these are some tricks that can be employed both for VR chat photos as well as um, if we pop back out to these photos. And you can see that I, I, I could do the same kinds of things for these. So like if we take this character and we drop the clarity down just a titch, now it's a much softer image. Here it was before and here it is after and it's just kind of kind of got this soft glow to them. Uh, we could we could modify the eyes by choosing to reduce clarity and texture in here just to de-emphasize the the rough texture. So. Anyways, so that, these are all different techniques that can be applied, regardless the the media. I hope that this was helpful, and feel free to drop me a line if you'd like more information, more insights. It was a bit of a speed run through the process, but yeah, I hope that it inspired a few of you and gave a few of you some ideas of your own, and I look forward to seeing you at this convention. Take care, and... Um, have a wonderful time.